Welcome everyone. I'm Dan Albaum, your host for today's Tidwit sponsored webinar, Demystifying Ecosystems 2.0. The presenter today is Tidwit CEO, Will Yaffe. And today you're gonna to get tips for strengthening your alliances when you need it most, and learn how innovative approaches to strategically enabling your ecosystems are paying off for global organizations through improved alliance relationships and sustainable business growth. Just a few housekeeping notes before we get started. Today's webinar is being recorded and you will receive access uh, following the session. We've also enabled question functionality. Simply type your question by clicking the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and we'll get to as many of those questions as possible toward the end of the webinar today. And now I'm handing it over to our presenter, Will Yaffe. Thanks, Dan. I appreciate it. Um, hi, everybody, and welcome to uh, Demystifying Ecosystems 2.0. Um, so uh, what I'd like to start with is just uh, basically sharing with you what, we've, uh, what we're doing. Tidwit is basically empowering uh, you know, alliances and, and tighter business relationships across a multitude of organizations and, um, and through ecosystem technology that we're very excited about. And, and what I wanted to kind of uh, share with you today is some of this, you know, kind of uh, really cool stuff that we're working with, uh, and how and how it's really affecting our uh, our customers. But let's start with the basics, which is what is a what is a business ecosystem, and uh, and what does it really mean? Well, the way that we define it is, in simple terms, it's an interconnected set of organizations uh, that are somehow um, uh, interdependent and. Uh, um, and they're all working together in order to reach uh, certain objectives to meet some needs. I mean, it's, uh, it, it's kind of uh, a, a unison of efforts between uh, different organizations. Now, the interesting thing about uh, ecosystems uh, or business ecosystems is that they've, they've been around for a while, uh, but what's happening right now is there's, a, there, there's dynamics that are changing how organizations see those ecosystems. Uh, and this is an interesting quote from Forrester that has really been doing some thought leadership uh, when it comes to, uh, to ecosystems. And it's, it, this, in this quote, they're saying, we're no longer in a world of linear partner programs. We're in a world of partner ecosystems. Everything is an ecosystem now. It's not just a single player or one player. Uh, you could see the interest in ecosystems by doing a very simple search uh, on Google where all of a sudden you have this huge spike of interest in ecosystems in general. But what is the, the need or the pains that these ecosystems are, are, are trying to, to attend to? Well, what, what we typically hear is that, uh, you know, these organizations, these alliances are telling us, hey, listen, we would like to uh, have seamless interconnectivity with our alliance partners. Uh, we want to be able to integrate and have more flexible architectures. Uh, we're looking for dynamic <clears throat> engagements that are rich for our users so that they can have a better experience. Uh, we're looking for um, uh, instant velocity so that everybody within our uh, network of alliances is on the same page instantly. Uh, some of them have also told us that they'd like to go within what we call an omnidirectional um, uh, basically approach, which provides upstream motions, meaning from a large partner to some of their providers or downstream motions, which are to their corporate customers or even side stream motions to their partners. And of course, last but not least is the importance for them of compliance and security. So all of these ecosystems uh, pains are leading towards what, you know, is being referred to as a digital ecosystem. So they're trying to digitize a lot of these efforts in order to provide the scale uh, and the compliance, et cetera, and all their needs. So if we look at it from this perspective, so what are these digital ecosystem models that emerged? Well, some of the early, uh, I guess, uh, versions of this uh, is what's referred to as the monolithic ecosystem or V1.0, if you will. Now, those are your typical proprietary portals that, you know, the partner portals and, and those kinds of uh, solutions that are one to many. So I, you know, I have my ecosystem and anybody who wants to connect to me has to come to me. They're typically single nodal, meaning it's a single node and users access it. So it's not like you have two organizations that have the, you know, like access between those organizations, it's just one set of users accessing another organization's portal. Um, 
those kinds of monolithic ecosystem models are what typically is referred to when people give examples of Apple and eBay and Amazon. Uh, that's what a monolithic ecosystem looks like. And so when, when people refer to in books like this ecosystem model uh, and give the examples of Apple and Amazon, what those are, are typically monolithic ecosystems, which are huge, but not very easy to emulate because of the very nature of the underlying business. And uh, if you wanted a paradigm kind of similarity, it would kind of look like almost the paradigm is almost like the mainframe of the 1970s. Now, fast forward to a few years uh, and into the present, and what you have is, you know, some people pushing what we call an API ecosystem model. So it's still monolithic, but now they're adding some connectivity. Uh, so it's still proprietary, it's still a one-to-many, it's sing still single node, but now they're telling people, well, you can actually connect your organization by using an API model. Now that would be easy if a partner only connects to one other partner because it's just a single set of APIs. But if a partner connects to thousands of partners or hundreds of other partners, the API model starts becoming very hard to scale. And if you add to that uh, the issue of, uh, you know, the technical difficulties of changing APIs, non-standard APIs, et cetera, now you're starting to see, you know, more and more difficulties, less scale, higher costs. So if we wanted to kind of look at this model, it's almost akin to the 1980s, early 90s PC slash lands paradigm, a little bit more openness, but not quite as scalable. So this gives us the, you know, the, if we fast forward to now and what's happening, uh, going forward is the polylithic or democratized ecosystem network, which essentially is a network that connects any ecosystem uh, or, an, or an organization's ecosystem with another organization's ecosystem. And in this case, you're, they're, they're basically getting economies of scale because it's a standardized process that uses only one set of APIs that connects that ecosystem to the network. And from that point on, they can connect to anybody else without any additional technical work. So it quickly becomes a scalable many-to-many -many model, multinodal. It could be multi-tier, so it could go upstream, it could go downstream, sidestream. And entire organizations can launch this. So now you could start seeing massive organizations connecting to one another in a standardized way without them having some of the pains uh, that we discussed. This, if you, if you wanted, again, to go back to the paradigm of the, of the IT industry, this would be almost like the introduction of something like uh, you know, as open as an internet, where everybody can just connect to and start interacting and exchanging knowledge. So let's take a look at what a, an ecosystems network does, and, and, and let's kind of look at or, or slice and dice some of its components. At the heart of an ecosystems network, you have three key components. First, the ability to create instances, cloud instances, right, um, that basically host all the processes and the data. Now, on top of this, what you see is, you know, certain apps or workloads that get built to automate some of the workloads. Uh, and then you have the reporting and the data. So that's at the heart of the ecosystem network. And of course, you've got, uh, you know, uh, the ability to create an ecosystem instance uh, and, 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 you know, instantly. And so what you start seeing is a lot of these e e uh, ecosystem instances, all of them connecting to the same network. So it's a single network, a single set of integration APIs, network-wide automation and apps, and network-wide analytics. So this is how an ecosystems network architecture uh, works. And the breakthrough is the openness and the speed and the scale by which it could be driven. So if we look at what organizations are using digital ecosystems for and who it touches, there's really three key workloads. So when you hear about ecosystems, you kind of have to figure out what is it exactly they mean by that. Um, the simplest one to understand is the basically the, the ecosystems or digital ecosystem solutions that deal with the specific notion of alliance management. So, you know, bringing individuals within two alliances to, to work together, co-sell, deal management, pipeline, it's CRM-ish uh, type of a interaction between two organizations uh, on a single, uh, let's say, uh, technology. Uh, or ecosystem environment. Uh, typically, this touches only a handful of people because alliances, yes, you've got alliances in one organization or another, but it's, it, you know, it, it could be in the dozens at tops. Uh, it's, it, it's related to the specific function of alliances, et cetera. 
You see other type of um, a usage for uh, ecosystems or what is referred to as uh, digital ecosystems. And those are the, the essentially the marketplaces. So you see either massive uh, partner networks or you see uh, maybe even marketplaces. Uh, for example, uh, some people look at the, uh, uh, the, Apple, um, uh, the Apple Store, uh, the Apple iStore or, uh, or excuse me, the, the Google Play, et cetera. Those are kind of transactional ecosystems. They're kind of B2C-ish in the sense still that they're, they're conducting some transactions and it's users, even though those users might come from, from organizations. Typically, the people running these, uh, uh, these, you know, these marketplaces, uh, you know, it's, it's a sale motion. So the people accessing it are the people who are specifically interested in the transaction and they will conduct the transaction. So here we're looking at, at maybe solutions that come from the likes of AppDirect, et cetera. Whereas in alliance management, we're looking at solutions that come from a work span, et cetera. And then you have the enablement. Now with enablement uh, and ecosystems, now that's the area that for us has been a key area of interest because that touches a whole host of workloads that organizations collaborate with one another on. Knowledge sharing, readiness, training, uh, certification, maybe marketing, campaigns, onboarding, live events, webinars, uh, uh, product development, a whole lot of project management, a whole lot of stuff goes into enablement uh, when it comes to ecosystems. That to us is an area that touches a whole host of more of people. And we're going to talk about this within a TIGWIT setting in just a minute, because the, you know, what we see is within an ecosystem, uh, within, within a, uh, at least a, a sizability element, uh, the ecosystems that run on TIGWIT as a network, are the smallest one we've got is about 3,000 users. And the, some of the largest ones we've got are exceeding 50,000 users within an ecosystem. Now, why those numbers? Because basically the workloads that we're working with touch a whole lot more people within one organization or the combination of two organizations than some of these other ecosystem uh, models. So let's take a look at what some of these workloads are. Uh, again, you have the kind of the, the Saturn ring at the center, which is the ecosystem network that basically provides the ecosystem instances, processes, data, apps, and reporting. And then the workloads that could sit on top of an ecosystem that could run between both organizations could be readiness, as mentioned, learning, maybe ECM, enterprise content management, things like uh, campaigns, marketing campaigns, correspondence tracking, tech support, live events, uh, you know, sales enablement, onboard, a whole host of these things could be run between two different ecosystems. And you could start imagining, hey, so, so does that mean that me as a, as a partner can actually work with some of my largest partners on enabling them to do this through this ecosystem network? And the answer is exactly right. This is what this kind of ecosystem technology or network technology allows. So how does it work? Well, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty simple and, and the breakthrough in architecture allows it to be extremely quick where essentially ecosystems could be instantly launched, we're talking in a matter of minutes, on the network. And then those specific workloads are being launched, uh, you know, that are relevant to these two organizations or these multitude of organizations. So there's nothing etched in stone. They could decide which workloads they want to be able to work with one another within that ecosystem partnership that they create. Uh, and then those, those relationships and those workloads start, you know, the automatic and dynamic syndication between these organizations. And of course, they could maintain the compliance, et cetera, within their own walls by applying SSO, et cetera, and launching unlimited usership. And this is also another key differential of the ecosystems version 2.0, because ecosystems need to grow without any limitations on usership, unlike the traditional portal technology, which is on a per user kind of model. And that's it. So that's, it's, it's that simple. In minutes, ecosystem instances could be launched uh, and joined uh, to other ecosystem uh, instances on the network. Now, of course, if, if there needs to be done for each one of the organizations, backend systems integrations, then each one of them can do it on their own. If they want to add or connect to more and more partners, they do it on their own. If, you know, if it, all of these kinds of uh, uh, white gloving or specific customizations could all be done by each one of the ecosystems without really touching or bothering the other partners that are on the network, uh, or even the partners that one is connecting to. They don't have to really know or be, uh, be uh, I guess, burdened by all the customizations that are happening for specific organizations. And after this, basically, one sits back and lets those, let, lets those uh, awesome ecosystem metrics roll. And here we're talking, because the ecosystem network allows for, the architecture allows for multi-tiering, 
you can imagine metrics starting to flow from n tiers down all the way up so that one gets full end-to-end -end visibility uh, of ecosystem metrics. So let's take a look at some scenarios. We're going to take a look at, uh, at a couple of very quick scenarios. One is a, uh, an ISV publisher. Um, we call them publishers, basically, but they're, they're an ISV. There's a, they are a vendor. Um, and they're launching an ecosystem instance, or they have certain needs. And let's say a partner, which is a large GSI, that's connecting to them. And let's take a look at you know, their needs and some of the benefits of real life cases that they've gotten. Uh, so let's start off with the ISV. With the ISV, the typical asks and needs that, you know, that, that are expressed to us is, hey, listen, I'm not getting enough traction on my portal or on my partner university. I need to be, really be able to scale that up. I need to be able to get more footprint within my partners. I'm not interested in the 20 or 30 users who access my portal. I want them to become 2,000 or 3,000. I need to be able to be closer to my partner. Uh, I need to connect and customize several of these partners or customers. Uh, how can I do that without really impinging on some of their own systems, et cetera? I need to be able to integrate or allow them to integrate with their own backend systems. And my, you know, my proprietary technology does not allow me to do that. Uh, and finally, I, you know, I don't want the headaches of GDPR or PII or you know, all the compliance stuff. I want them to deal with their usership. All I really need are the metrics of usage, not necessarily the per user. It could be both ways. I mean, they could open this up, but some of the ISVs have expressed that to us. And so in this specific case, one of the specific cases we deployed in less than a week, instant plug into the ecosystem network. And by plugging into the ecosystem network, that specific ISV launched multiple workloads that they were interested in partnering with others uh, on the ecosystem network. Um, so uh, their instance basically uh, spun up readiness and learning workloads or apps, voucher campaigns, assessment certification, and marketing campaigns. Those were the things that were relevant to that specific ISV. So instant launch and connectivity with other partners that were on the network zero uh, engineering effort for backend integration. It was done with very basic uh, uh, APIs on the backend uh, that were handled on, on, on the ecosystem network side of things, not on their backend side. Uh, they were able to essentially deliver more than 50K digital assets uh, in real time and constantly being refreshed as a knowledge repository uh, with usership increasing 20% month on month which is, you know, for the, we're talking for the past two years, that average is pretty high. Um, them reaching organizations uh, globally uh, in 72 countries uh, and millions of views, uh, tens of thousands of certifications, uh, and we're talking uh, half a million plus hours spent. So the, the, the success of this has been massive to the extent of more than a 20x ROI for that specific um, ISV. Now let's look at it from the perspective of, uh, of the, the other uh, side, which is a partner uh, who wants to also join one of these ISVs and be able to, to benefit from the partnership or the alliance that they've got with one another, always focusing on this enablement feature. Uh, and so we're going to look at what the partner needs are, what the, the partner needs are. I need to integrate more tightly with one or multiple vendors, but I need it to be standardized. And perhaps now with COVID, we're getting more and more requests to be able to help them launch cloud weeks and for it not to be done once a month, but rather for it to be done once a week uh, or twice a month. Uh, so that kind of repetitive motion, you can imagine for the ISV upstream to have to dedicate resources for that specific partner, it's almost impossible. But if we're empowering that partner to do it on their own, it becomes quite possible. And, and I'll mention some of the, the metrics in a minute. Um, I need to integrate processes, content, metrics. Uh, I need to be able to uh, have full visibility into what my users are doing. If I send my users to a different portal, I lose all kinds of visibility and that doesn't help me as a partner be able to help my ISV uh, you know, reach the goals that we've agreed upon and, and our alliance. Um, compliance, security constraints. A lot of these are affecting some of the companies. Uh, I have customization requests. I need, for example, uh, to integrate into my back-end HR system. I need to be able to integrate into my, my LMS, uh, and I need to be able to scale quickly globally without it really having my users go through full registration process. I want it to be integrated with my back-end SSO, all that kind of stuff. Or, for example, we've even gotten requests for, I want to now be able to do what I do in-house, 
with my ecosystem downstream, with my partner upstream, I want to be able to replicate that downstream uh, with my corporate customers. Again, all of these can happen uh, seamlessly with an ecosystem network architecture approach. Uh, and this is an example. For example, we launched a Cloud Week uh, motion for one of the largest GSIs in the world, and we helped them set up uh, campaigns uh, to, 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 to reach their target is pretty ambitious, it's reaching about 150,000 people. Uh, and in the past, I think two and a half months, they've hit 50,000 already. Uh, I mentioned some of the metrics in just a second, but we helped them set it up, launch, uh, as well as uh, get all the reporting that they were looking at. So those, you know, the ability to, to, to do all of this in such a short time, in such a light mode, can be done with an ecosystems network approach. It is extremely difficult to be done if we're looking at it, uh, uh, you know, from some of the traditional monolithic ecosystem models. Um, so what are some of the tangible results? Uh, well, they use some of the workloads that they were interested in, which is being able to launch campaigns to their usership, uh, integrated seamlessly with some of the vouchers that were coming in and being processed within their alliance. In other words, uh, almost like the transfer of, of funding in order to be able to uh, to get certifications and examination, uh, MDF or uh, you know marketing development funds, uh, and of course readiness and learning. So those are workloads that we find that are common, but again the ecosystem allows many other workloads to be launched or apps to be launched. So for this specific partner, instant launch, instant connectivity to the ISV, uh, backend integration with zero engineering effort on their part, um, and within the the past two and a half months they've hit uh, the 50k user. Uh, uh, mark, 15% month on month with a skyrocketing that has happened in the past two and a half to three months. Probably COVID related, but their goal is even triple what they've been able to accomplish so far. Um, and uh, so we're very excited about that. Hundreds of thousands of hours already spent by their individuals, an approximate uh, savings of about two and a half million dollars uh, that, that are estimated with, a, with an ROI of about 16x. So we're very excited about this technology uh, and what it's enabling some of these largest technology companies to do. Uh, and we're very proud of the fact that, you know, we started with technology companies and some of these are the most advanced technology companies in the world and trying to provide them a new way to connect to one another, uh, a way that doesn't go with the monolithic approach, uh, which jostles one against the other, but rather a collaborative approach where they can basically integrate uh, their ecosystem with some of the others while at the same time providing them uh, their specific needs and, and compliance uh, constraints, respecting those, et cetera. So seamless in, uh, interconnectivity, uh, uh, enriched engagement, unprecedented line of sight, all of those are delivered. And the results really speak for themselves. The network usage has, been, has increased by more than 900%. Um, we're getting uh, hundreds of thousands of users uh, usage from, uh, uh, from more than 100 countries at this point, uh, with more than 100 million shared data points. Uh, with an ecosystem approach, one of the most exciting things that we see is the ability for us to provide uh, you know, this community with metrics that they would have not had insight for, things that they can benchmark, providing them predictive analytics, providing them a way to compare themselves generically, of course, so that we protect the, the private data uh, of the different ecosystems. But at least now they have points of reference, uh, you know, and, 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 and business intelligence that they did not have before, you know, like learning when they should launch events, how effective should it be, how many users uh, they should expect, if they wanted this number of users, how big of a campaign they should be launching, all that kind of stuff becomes readily available uh, in these shared data points that we can provide. So some of the key benefits of an ecosystem, um, uh, essentially instantly launching, um, making it extremely a dynamic process, massive scale up with cost and time redu reductions, since all of this is being done on the cloud using the cloud ecosystem model. Um, we're talking time to market, helping them time to market and velocity in their alliances through full automation between two organizational ecosystems that would have been otherwise not connected. An omnidirectional growth, um, upstream, sidestream, downstream of ecosystems, because essentially this breakthrough approach breaks a lot of these uh, pre-existing barriers. 
uh, and protection of user data uh, with compliance, security, GDPR, and PII. And one thing that perhaps is not mentioned here is that they, through the ecosystem network approach, they now can take even more advantage of their previous investments and their previous backends that may have been limited in terms of access because we don't rip and replace anything that exists uh, from the past. We actually empower it to reach more and more footprint and more and more partners uh, and users. So what really this, the, the, the ecosystem uh, uh, version you know, 2.0, if you will, what it's really doing is it's taking digital transformation to the next frontier, which is essentially digitally transforming the entire ecosystem as opposed to just a single organization uh, you know, uh, and within its own walls. Now we're providing the ability uh, to basically digitally transform uh, all the organizations with whom one is allied or one is partnered. Uh, so with this, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, provide uh, you guys with, with some resources. I, I, I would like to invite you to see some more, um, uh, you know, so, some more about what we discussed today on tidbit.com. We have a blog, uh, we have videos and webinars, uh, cases that we can share and research uh, that we've done internally, but also other resources. I know Forrester Research is doing some great work. Uh, with Jay McBain and, 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 his, and his team. They're doing some awesome work when it comes to ecosystem and thought leadership there. Accenture, Deloitte, McKinsey, they're all also coming in on the ecosystem space and kind of adding their own thought processes. So there's a lot of resources out there, but of course, we'd love to hear from you. So uh, if, if you guys have any questions about you know, what we discussed today, by all means, please feel free to uh, to reach out uh, to me at will at tidbit.com or to, uh, to tidbit at uh, us at tidbit.com. I will be more than happy uh, to, uh, to answer any of the questions that you might have. Uh, so Dan, back to you. And uh, if you have any, uh, if the community has any questions, I'm, I'll, I'll be happy to answer them in whatever time we've got left. Thanks, Will. Uh, we do have a few minutes left. And I want to remind everyone, if you do have a question, to please use the Q&A functionality. You can type that in and we can certainly try to address that in the last couple of minutes. I do have one submitted question, Will. You talked about uh, some really large numbers in terms of user scalability and in some cases it was a pretty rapid scaling. Um, are there limits when you think about how to structure uh, and, and leverage a network uh, ecosystem? Are there, are there number limits or is this really an infinite uh, type of scalability and growth? Well, the limits are the number of employees in a specific company. So if you have a company, let's say a GSI that has a couple of hundred, 200, 300,000 uh, users, the, the limit is, you know, how much this organization wants to allow from its user base to access their own ecosystem. Limits, the, the network itself does not limit, uh, you know, how many people can access. Uh, the limits are placed by the organization itself and on its, on its own ecosystem. So theoretically, there are no limits except for, I guess, the size of the of the business and how many employees it might have. And our model, at least from a Tidwit, uh, you know, cloud ecosystem perspective is we don't have, it's not based on the, uh, you know, on a per user. So we don't have a per user model. Uh, ours is completely different and basically it's unlimited users. Uh, so, you know, if we can spread the love, uh, we, you know, we're happy to do that within all of the organization, the partner organizations that are on our network. Great, and it's looking, and uh, I guess we have one final question that has come in. So Will, in thinking about deploying these kinds of programs, leveraging uh, uh, the uh, platform uh, as part of this uh, ecosystem capability, is there some common pushback that sometimes, or obstacles, you know, that the sponsors of, of these kind of programs face, and maybe are there some best practices, some ideas on how to overcome some of those obstacles? I think the biggest obstacle is an understanding of what you know an ecosystems network and uh, ecosystem instances can do. The first uh, myth or misconception is that they're going in there to replace whatever exists. They don't. Um, I think so. One of our, one of one of the key things that we try to uh, work together with our customers is not a rip and replace strategy, but rather an extensibility strategy, where they take all the investments that they've placed in their LMSs and in their partner, uh, you know, uh, their PRMs and and all that, and make them more and more extensible through an ecosystem network approach to their partner base. So that's really one of the key pushbacks that we get. Another pushback we get is looking at the ecosystem as a single workload function. For example, you know, a learning specific or a marketing specific. In reality, uh, a successful ecosystems network 
should be able to uh, essentially support many of these workloads simultaneously on a single environment. Because you don't want to be connecting to multiple ecosystem networks just to do one function at a time. So no, we do not compete against learning teams and no, they do not need to put uh, you know, modes around them. We're actually providing them extensibility at the same time as we're providing maybe their marketing departments uh, and maybe their sales organizations as well with that extensibility. So those are some of the, uh, you know, kind of, I guess, low hanging fruit pushbacks that we get then. All right. Thanks a lot, Will. Well, we're at 30 minutes and so we're going to wrap things up. On behalf of Tidwit, I'd like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar and be looking for additional information on how to access the recording from today's session. Everyone have a wonderful day.